Now for the technical needs of translation, it, it needs to be online. Um, now this could be, of course, in the cloud, or in our case, it, it's required to be on-prem. Uh, but it needs to be online, it needs to be fast. It needs to be something that the actual clinician has access to. Of course, that means it also needs to be secure, needs to be easy to interpret, and it needs to support downstream clinical workflow. So um, this is kind of the, the sketch that was drawn for how we take a prostate lesion detection algorithm and actually bring it into clinical deployment. So on the left, we have the NCI team. On the right, we have the NVIDIA team, um, who's really been instrumental in, in helping us bring this algorithm forward. So the algorithm itself, I, I won't go into too many technical details on it. Uh, I, I've listed the publication here if you're interested in reading about it. Um, but what essentially we're doing is we're taking biparametric, multiparametric MRI, uh, and we're segmenting lesions that are suspicious for prostate cancer. So these would be following the PIRADS guidelines. We trained it from a diverse cohort of patients, so that's one important thing. Patients who were negative for any findings on imaging, negative on any biopsies, patients who had surgery, so that we had, know that they had disease, and then a group of all comers. So anybody who comes in the clinic, just so we get some more heterogeneity in there. Um, the performance, again, I, I would invite you to read the paper, but really we saw it was comparable to others in the literature and comparable to what the agreement between experts in the field is. Okay, great, so we have it. Now let's put it in the clinic. What does that actually mean? Um, for us, what we wanted to do is have a user in our PAC system be able to push a study to an inference engine and receive the result back. Uh, to do this, we did set up a dedicated deployment server within the radiology department. And we're using the Clara Deploy SDK from NVIDIA to do this. So this essentially handles the, the DICOM sending, receiving, as well as kind of the management of workflow. So if we push a bunch of studies at once, how is it gonna prioritize which ones get done at a, at a given time. That's all done through Clara. Now, the patient selection and the pipeline executor are controlled by the PACS user, and that's important, and, and I'll further emphasize that in a moment. So what does this actually look like? Um, again, we have an algorithm. What does that mean for a clinician when we say, oh, we have an algorithm? Great. Um, we take a series of inputs, so in our case, we take the multiparametric MRI and the whole prostate volume. We send it through four sequential 3D deep learning models. So this is the whole prostate segmentation. We detect the lesions, we filter out false positives due to benign hyperplasia, and then we classify for the PIRAD score. Ultimately, for the academic paper, we get an output that looks like this. It's a mask of the lesion, and it'll have a, a PIRAD score associated with it. Now, for clinical workflow, there's a whole bunch of important steps that are missed just from what we, what we read in a paper. As I mentioned, the, the patient study is identified as a prostate MRI. The appropriate sequences are selected for processing. Uh, we call it multiparametric MRI. There's actually about 10 to 15 sequences that would actually be within this image, so selecting out the ones that are relevant for AI. Um, the pipeline is called from PACS for execution. And then the sequences need to be sorted um, into this is T2, this is the ADC, for example. Now, we utilize as much as we can, as I, as I mentioned about the security that's involved in all of this, this is where we felt like, let's put it in the hands of the users. So for example, um, at NCI, we have a protocol, patients are consenting for their data to be used for this purpose. Now, how do we make sure that the right patients go through the right algorithm? Within our PACS system, only specific users, who would be the PI or the AIs of those protocols, can actually select the pipeline to be executed, and they select the appropriate sequences. This, for our initial phase of deployment, is really important because we're making sure that the actual intended use of the algorithm is on its way. In the future, could this all be automated? That would be great. Right now, we're trying to essentially walk before we run. Now, as I mentioned, it's great if we can get the algorithm to run, but what comes back out and how is that useful for the radiologist? So the results need to be viewable in PACS, and they need to be modifiable downstream for either research or interventional procedures. I think that's a, a huge need in the field for actually understanding how 
clinicians are going to interact with the AI. So our group has done a number of studies. We have two previous medical fellows who ran multi-reader studies on previous versions of, of these CAD algorithms. So what they're doing is we have the readers in these studies who are both experts and non-experts. They are reading the MRI on its own, and then they're reading the MRI with the AI output, and we're trying to see if AI helped them. Now, how do we present it to them? On the left, in the Gower study, we presented them with a probability map. On the right, in the Moralavan study, we presented them with a bounding box of four interesting high target regions within the prostate. What we saw in the GAR study is that there was a decreased level of trust in the expert readers that actually caused the experts plus AI to be worse than AI alone or the experts alone. And that's because there's too many false positives. They weren't able to actually understand what was the most important part of this probability map, and that led to decreased performance. So that's what we don't want to see. It did help, however, less experienced readers. Now, in the Moralavan study, what was interesting is with these bounding boxes, we saw something a little bit different. The experts actually, when given these four bounding boxes, they had increased trust. So they were being presented with things that they already knew. They can say, okay, yeah, I, I already know that's a lesion. But now in some of these other boxes, the more nuanced lesions, they were actually detecting better. Um, however, the, the inexperienced readers still they benefited from AI, but there's still, um, it's to be worked out what that level of trust is, because maybe they're trusting the AI too much and calling too many things. Um, but really, in both of these studies, we learned that the expert readers, whether they trust it or not, is really important for, for how we do it. So what we've worked out for this current algorithm, and as we're deploying in PACS, this is for a, a patient that we ran last week. This is our actual PACS interface, so this is what's coming back to the radiologist, we show them both. So we show them the segmentation map. This is what would truly be called by AI. And then we also show them the probability map. So this allows them to have the spatial context and again, work to develop that trust. We're hoping that we can kind of combine those two previous reader studies we had um, and, and get some better results by really utilizing what we learned, what the experts had told us, um, and then deploying that. So, so overall, for this project, um, in terms of deployment, our average processing time is one minute and 20 seconds. We're, we're currently ongoing and doing a larger validation study of this algorithm with multi-readers as well as single readers. We do output also a research-friendly mesh. I think this is also important because if we actually wanted to have the readers be able to modify what they think the algorithm did good or poorly, uh, those types of features are, are really important. So the challenges in ongoing work, all of the non-standard DICOM that I quickly skipped over when I said we put that in the hands of the expert. I think that's important for security, but it's also a little shortcut because DICOM can be very non-standard in terms of how sequences are named or how they're acquired. There's a lot of work left to be done in that area as well. All right, so now I'll move on to two pathology projects. And these ones are more how, in terms of translation, we're, to be honest, both of these projects are still ongoing. So we're trying to bring the knowledge we gained in radiology as we develop pathology algorithms. And that really told us, told us we need to bring the experts in sooner. Um, and so here, we have the same questions, of course, for development. But we need to be able to translate anything we learn to whole site imaging. We have learned from radiology. We have to have results that are easy to interpret. And of course, it needs to be fast. Um, so we are working with the Joint Pathology Center. Um, this, if, if you're unfamiliar with it, it's associated with Walter Reed and the DOD. So these would be military, uh, members of the military who are undergoing treatment. Um, what's very interesting about this data set, and actually interesting, I should say important, about this data set, is it's an equal access care setting as its members of the military. So they're being treated at military health facilities. Um, that also means that the outcomes would be equal access and have less heterogeneity in how these patients are followed, given that they're in the military system. So there's over 2,000 patients. We are actively still acquiring data. So I think we just hit 10,000 slides and about 500 patients. But um, 
our first question was, okay, we're getting all this data, how do we actually annotate it? And as we're training, how do we annotate it such that we can develop algorithms that the pathologist will want to use? Um, so we do have some slides that, of course, the pathologist is labeling as they're going through. We then have our AI-based detection prediction map. That map is only so useful to them when it's a, a small image. We want to actually have them interact with the slide. So what we've done is we've translated, translated our probability maps into outputs that can be read by publicly available viewers. So this is, for example, QPath. We chose QPath, frankly, just because it's able to be opened in all operating systems. So we knew we'd be able to, to capture everyone with this. Um, but what we're doing is actually going through, as we're training, as we're labeling the data, we're using AI. And then in a subset of cases, we're pulling it out having the expert review it, and then refining by penalizing specifically on those cases. So what we are finding consistently is, especially in these whole mount cases where there's a lot of heterogeneous tissue, we are finding some areas that just by using the pathologist labels we may have missed as actually being a, a ground truth positive region. So um, what we've seen even just by using 100 slides, the first two rows here for the 5X and 10X models, those are trained from biopsies. Now, once we start using even just 100 slides from 14 patients in this JPC set, our foci sensitivity, tumor sensitivity, they all go up. Um, so this is what we're hoping to see. Our false positives also go up. I think it could be attributed to, again, that large heterogeneous whole mount tissue. Uh, we're working on decreasing this. We expect it to go down as we you know, reach our goal of, of adding all 2,000 patients in. Now, we have a, and I I've put a picture here of our postdoc, Shishant Patkar, who's working on this. We're also interested in grading. Now, again, how do we take a subjective score that's assigned to a patient, and as we're training on different subregions of an image, how do we bring the pathologist back in such that they trust? This is a multi-label problem. So it's not just saying this is three, this is four. There are areas that are predicted as being a mix of three and four. Um, so we're still working on this. What we found actually, again, to have an interpretable model, we need to also have trust from the pathologist. So interpretability, at least in my opinion, has two kind of phases. One is from the actual developers, us. We need to know what's going on in the model, but also it needs to be interpretable and usable by, by the end user. So we're working on different ways of overlaying this information. Again, this is all expert in loop training. So we're pulling slides out, we're reviewing how we're doing, and then we're retraining based on those. And so as I've mentioned, um, we found the magnification had a, an impact on the model. Uh, validation of the grading performance can be very difficult. But um, it's ongoing work, and ultimately what we're interested in, of course, is not just sticking to cancer detection and cancer grading, but we'd like to try to predict outcomes, particularly th in this important patient population, um, and we're looking forward to continuing the work. So the, the last project I'll talk about is, is a little different. So this is how can we develop annotation schemes based on deep learning to aid the clinical workflow. And this setting is in metastatic prostate cancer. So it's rare for men to get to the metastatic phase, but once they do, there's a high mortality rate. The disease heterogeneity in this setting, too, it's a long course disease. So often by this time, it's not the same disease that it started out localized in the prostate. There's typically, historically, not that many biopsies taken from these patients. They were risky. It's often in the bone. We didn't have good targeting agents. Now, as interventional procedures, as well as medical imaging, particularly PSMA PET-CT imaging, we have seen more routine biopsies being taken. It's also increased with the fact that more patients are being sequenced, and it's important to sequence the disease that's there, not the disease that was in the primary tumor. Um, now, the biggest issue here is that there's really not a, a set standard of morphological features in advanced prostate cancer. There's no Gleason grading system. There's a few interesting features that, are, that could be important, but what we're looking to do, and this is in collaboration with Michael Hafner at the Fred Hutch, is develop a series of histomorphological features using AI. 
So here what we're essentially doing is using deep learning, but it's just to extract the features so that we can understand the spatial context. We started simple with molecular classification based on neuroendocrine disease. This is something we knew, we had an inkling that even if we train off of the molecular data, we should have some feature that we can see in the H&E image because the pathologist is able to identify these cases. So again, we're using deep learning to extract the features, but then we're doing more handcrafted features to understand the spatial assessment. Why are we doing it this way? Again, we're trying to develop trust with the pathologist here, interpretability on both ends, interpretability from the deep learning perspective or from the computer science perspective, as well as interpretability for the physician as we work together to try to understand the patterns of this disease. And as we do this, we hope to add more and more molecular information as we keep going through the process. So the, the major takeaways from today, I think there's not just from my talk, but I, as the, the previous speakers have alluded to, there's many clinical opportunities for AI and prostate cancer imaging. There's a huge need for more research in what I call implementation science. So how are users actually interacting with these algorithms, and how can we use what we learn there to actually inform how we're training new algorithms? Um, overall, again, to actually translate and deploy, we need to be secure. It needs to be easy to interpret, and eventually it needs to support downstream clinical workflow so that we can ask interesting research questions from these algorithms. And with that, I'll say thank you to a, a number of collaborators, um, as well as the group. I put in big red font. We are also hiring. As you've heard, it's very difficult to find particularly postdoc fellows, but we're always hiring. We're also hiring post-bac fellows, so if you have anybody that's interested, please send them my way. And thank you for your attention. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're about ready to step into our panel on sustainable AI and clinical care. Uh, we have three panelists that will be joining us and giving us brief presentations, and then we'll be sharing some of the perspectives. Uh, we've put a wonderful group together that's going to bring some complementary perspectives. Now, one of the things we may need logistically is to get a few chairs up on stage, so while we work on that, imagine that. They just show up. Um, we'll get things set up from that. I'm going to ask that our presenters do a little bit to introduce themselves. Uh, they come from some complementary backgrounds and that, that overlap with things and are going to touch on issues that may be a little bit different that we've mentioned, uh, but going to be very important to the solutions for sustainable AI. As we were putting the overall agenda and program together, we tried to go all the way through the spectrum of research to translating research into clinical care and then taking clinical care, and as we have things that are deployed, what are the things that we also need to do to make sure that that deployment remains successful and impactful for the cancer patient? So our panelists are going to help us address those questions today. So we have Jonathan Green, uh, Director of the Office of Human Subject Research with the National Institutes of Health. We have Barbara Evans, Evans from the University of Florida, Wertheim College of Engineering, and Roxanne Jensen, Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences at the National Cancer Institute. And so with that, I'm going to ask our panelists to, to uh, come and take the uh, chair, and then we'll ask Jonathan to lead off the presentation. Thank you. 
Um, my name is Jonathan Green. Uh, as you heard, I'm the director for the Office of Human Subjects Research Protections uh, within the Office of Intramural Research at the National Institutes of Health. So uh, in that capacity, I oversee the Human Research Protection Program uh, just for the, the intramural program at NIH, the things that happen mostly inside the fences uh, in Bethesda. Uh, I am also a clinician. I a uh, pulmonary and critical care doc, uh, and prior to coming to NIH, I was uh, uh, an investigator uh, studying basic and cellular immunology at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Um, anyway, so uh, my, my colleagues will, uh, uh, my co-panelists will also introduce themselves as they come up, but we, we were asked to talk about sustainable AI in clinical care, and, and when we met, none of us were exactly sure what that meant, so we thought we would each talk about what we know, and hopefully at the end it'll all sum and equal uh, sustainable AI in clinical care. So I'm, I'm gonna be wearing mostly my IRB hat uh, here as I talk to you, um, and, and sort of point out some of the issues that I think have already been brought out um, in, in previous talks. Uh, I have no disclosures uh, at all because I'm a Fed, uh, but these are uh, my opinions and, and not necessarily those of NIH or the government. So being a, an IRB guy, I always have to go back and think about the Belmont Report uh, and really the three sort of foundational principles um, that oversee when we um, look at human subjects research. And those, of course, are respect for persons, uh, beneficence, and justice. And when I think about those in the context of a uh, a sort of more typical clinical trial that uh, IRBs would review. Um, of course, in respect for persons, we, we operationalize that through uh, the informed consent process. <coughs> we think carefully about privacy and confidentiality protections, and we think about what sort of extra protections might be needed um, to, uh, for, for vulnerable populations. Uh, with the principle of beneficence, really, which is the obligation uh, to do good, we think about during the research, how do we minimize any potential for harm to those who might uh, enroll in our research studies, and how could we maximize benefits both for an individual as well as the society at large in which the, the research is taking place. And then in our, we, we think about justice as an equitable subject selection, that, that how do we assure that both the benefits and the burdens of research are fairly distributed, um, and making sure that there's both uh, access to the, the good of research and, and no exploitation of vulnerable populations or uh, in enrollment. But it's a little more challenging when we try to map these to this, the problems that uh, the, uh, the review of AI and machine learning type things, which is on one level we can think, oh, this is extremely low risk research, we're not even really touching people. But there are a lot of, uh, there are very different considerations and we can sort of try to map these a little bit to our, our sort of traditional framework of principles and, and uh, in, in full transparency, this is a slide I took from a, a uh, presentation on this, this topic at an at annual conference of uh, IRB people just this last year. So I'm gonna talk about some of these in more detail and then my, my co-panelists will, will give a little bit more detail uh, on these. But in respect for persons, right, we're gonna think again about privacy and that's both in the, the use of that data and, and who has agency over its use. The issues around both transparency and explainability um, for AI accountability, uh, and then and the fairness and non-discrimination, and I'll touch more on those in, as I go through. So when we think about what are the potential harms that might come from this sort of research, which is of course as, a, as an IRB guy what I have to think about, there are of course a lot of things around privacy. I think Barbara will go a lot more into that, but there's um, the risk being of course uh, the breach of privacy, but we have to think about, the, you know, obviously we're harvesting in, in this machine learning, just reams and reams of data. We're collecting data from all sorts of sources. Uh, uh, and um, that data is often collected from individuals who have no idea that you are using their data. 
Um, we think about the, the transparency issue. We've already in several of the prior speakers talked about the black box. Um, and the, the risk there, right, not so much for the people generating the algorithm, but the end users is, the, you know, the unknown why. There are so many, when there's so many hundreds of thousands of data points going in and we're getting algorithms out that we don't really understand what goes into them, uh, those models can be inappropriately generalized, right? If we don't really know what is, um, what makes up the algorithm, we, it's, it makes it more easy to inappropriately apply those. And again, I think that becomes a greater risk as these things come into general uh, practice. Um, we think about then uh, some of these harms can be at a group level and are more likely to be at a group level than in a conventional research study, right, where we think about typical harms being to the individual. But as we apply these um, algorithms uh, to populations, they may disproportionately affect one group of people versus another. We think about the issues around accountability um, and really who is there any accountability and who, if there are harms that are caused, where, who is accountable for them? Is there any recourse or do those groups of people even know that they're going to, that they've experienced these harms? And then I, it has, has also been discussed previously in these sessions, issues around fairness and non-discrimination. And I, I think it's more than just whose data are we putting in the data set to make sure we have represented, but who's at the table as we design these, uh, these algorithms and things to make sure that we're thinking of all the things that we need to to be inclusive um, uh, as, we, as we generate these, uh, these uh, algorithms. I want to touch now just basically uh, on the regulatory framework that as an IRB we have to think about and you as investigators as you design your studies um, so we have many rules, as you know, uh, that we have to comply with. If you are federally funded, you have to comply with the HHS rules, the common rule. Uh, if the study is FDA regulated, um, you have to comply with the uh, FDA regulations. If you are a HIPAA covered entity, you have HIPAA to consider. If you're not, you may have the Privacy Act. If you're in Europe, you may have the EU GDPR uh, and many other regulatory frameworks. And there's a lot of challenges in trying to figure out which of these regs apply and how they apply. So it's not clear even if the research is subject to the common rule. There's ambiguity here. For one, the common rule only applies to federally funded projects. So if you have no federal funds, while your institution may apply the common rule, you're actually not subject to the common rule. One of the key features that puts you under the common rule is identifiability. Uh, and so for, we struggle with, okay, are these data sets truly identifiable or de-identified? They come, many times come to say, well, this is de-identified data, but I think as you all know, probably way better than me, with the amount of data on any given point that we have in there, I don't know that there's such a thing as de-identified data anymore. Um, many of these studies would fit under, uh, even if they, if they do come under the common rule, may fit under some of the exempt categories so the, the protections of the common rule don't apply because they've been exempted uh, as low-risk research. There's a structural limitation in the application of the common rule that IRBs are, are subject to, and I've got that highlighted here. Sorry, you can't read it terribly well. This is one of the criteria for approval. Uh, IRBs have to review things under sp uh, specific uh, what we call criteria for approval. And one of them is, this is the second one, that risks to, or to subjects are reasonable in relation to anticipated benefits, et cetera. But there's a restriction on that that says IRBs should not consider the possible long range effects uh, of applying the knowledge gained in the research, e.g. the possible effects of the research on public policy as among the research risks that fall within its purview of responsibility. So many of the actual risks of this kind of research may be in policy and in long-term implications, but IRBs actually, by regulation, can't consider those. Um, and so that's a large gap in how we think of it. Data privacy is, of course, a huge issue here, and the current U.S. regulatory framework is really grossly insufficient to consider those kinds of risks in these studies. These studies are also subject to, uh, many times subject to FDA regulations. Uh, we have to ask the question, is this research a clinical investigation of a device? 
while this may not be a traditional device like a heart valve or, a, or a, an artificial joint, these actually meet the regulatory definitions of devices if the intended use is the diagnosis, cure, treatment, or mitigation of disease, which in many cases it is. And then the IRBs have to decide how do we apply the FDA regulations to this, when is the research actually subject to those, is it testing the safety and efficacy, are we in an assay development phase, uh, and then what are the risk determinations that an IRB has to make for these studies. Um, even though, again, we have to think about risks that are not, not your traditional risk of, you know, an individual being harmed. FDA regs also are, are a challenge because of the, the definition of what's a human subject in FDA. And if we draw the analogy of these sorts of studies to sort of more typical in vitro diagnostic devices, um, in the FDA world, um, actually identifiability doesn't come into play for subjects, even um, uh, even a de-identified image, but also the FDA regs, as you see, consider the, a specimen to be a human subject. So if you're just taking a path specimen, from a, a de-identified path specimen is a human subject in the FDA world. When we're looking at imaging then, does that mean a de-identified image from a person is a human subject and now places it under FDA regulations? <clears throat> um, there's data privacy regulations, of course, that we all struggle through. HIPAA, if you're a HIPAA, um, uh, HIPAA covered entity, Privacy Act for many of us in the government, the EU GDPR, which is enormously complex that we have to consider as we gather and use these data. So lots and lots of regulatory issues. What do, in my view, what do I think we need? We certainly need a, uh, within the regulatory co community, a better, clear understanding and articulation of what the potential benefits and harms of the kinds of research that we're doing, particularly around the data collection and the downstream uses of the data. We need a regulatory framework that really adequately addresses the privacy issues that we're, we've talked about and we'll talk more about, and uh, an ability to consider the long-term impact of some of this work on the groups, and uh, a lot more public engagement in this process. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Evans. We'll talk about the next one. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm affiliated with the School of Engineering. I'm also on the law faculty. I started in life as an electrical engineer, and I got tired of having lawyers tell me what I could and couldn't do, so I went to law school so that I could talk back. Um, <laughs> I was asked to discuss AI in clinical care and I'm really going to take that clinical word seriously. All of us at this point in our history tend to think of data ethics in terms of research ethics, such as the common rule. The AI we've been talking about at this conference can be used in research but a lot of it is destined to be used in clinical health care to render diagnoses and treatment plans for specific patients. This puts it under a different type of ethical framework. Let's see if I can advance my slide. I want to talk about how uh, the ethics of clinical data use are not the same thing as the ethics of research data use. We have two competing theories of access to data that are both afoot in the world. One is the control over information theory. This is reflected, for example, in the common rule. It's the notion that privacy is a personal right for people to say what happens to their data and how it can be used. Um, this conceives people as self-determining agents, and we respect their right of self-determination. Um, ethicists say that this method sort of puts autonomy over the other Belmont principles of justice, equality, um, beneficence. We've really triumphed autonomy in our thinking about data access. 
there is a different framework that's in, I'm not theorizing here, this is real law. It's medical privacy law that applies to clinical health care. It takes a different view. It still respects those Belmont principles, but it sort of says people when they're sick may be too vulnerable to be asked to protect their own privacy by reading all the privacy disclosures. And the way we protect privacy in that setting is to put the data handlers under very strong fiduciary obligations to be careful with data. And this is traditionally worked by having physicians, nurses who are licensed. They have really stringent licensing requirements to um, be serious about confidentiality. And that has been the main protection. And it's an ethics of beneficence. We don't tell people you should protect your own privacy by consenting or not. We say the people who handle your data have got to protect it or we'll take their licenses away. It's just a different approach. And this is used in US state medical privacy law. The HIPAA privacy rule didn't come up with new things. It drew on the traditions of state medical privacy law and tried to embody them. Interestingly, GDPR defers to the member states of the EU to set their own medical privacy law, and they come up with norms that look a lot like what we're accustomed to. I want to show you those norms. I'm going the wrong way here. This is, and I don't expect you necessarily can read all these things. I want you to kind of see the whole extent of it. These are all of the data uses that are allowed under the HIPAA privacy rule. I went through and counted. There's 27 ways you can access data under HIPAA. In blue, I have marked the ones that correspond to the common rule. You can do it with individual authorization, consent. You can strip off identifiers, or you could get a ethics review board to uh, give you a waiver. Those are three of the 27 ways. There's 24 other ways you can move data. These are allowed data uses that are considered ethical in a clinical healthcare setting, such as we have decided that it's ethical to report child abuse to state authorities. We've decided it's ethical to facilitate the dignified burial of deceased persons. We allow data to flow for that. Look at the one I've numbered six. The HIPAA privacy rule allows healthcare providers to share data without consent for use in treating a patient, including another patient. My data can be shared by my physician with your physician if, for example, your physician is trying to learn about a condition that I have and you're suspected of having. Do you realize that a lot of clinical AI is basically kind of bootstrapping that, that process that used to go on in the physician's head of comparing to other cases? A lot of clinical AI and diagnostic AI could qualify as a treatment use of the data, which would allow great uh, facilitation of data flows to improve healthcare. I think I'll skip through this. I, I just want to note that in 2011, the Office uh, for Human Research Protections noted in the Federal Register that um, there are some concerns with the ability of IRBs to manage privacy issues. Um, privacy is increasingly something that requires a lot of technical understanding, differential privacy, federated learning systems, and it's very hard uh, to have the IRB process be staffed with people who will be able to say, do we need to have federated learning here, or could we use differential privacy? And they um, proceeded with a rulemaking that aims to reduce the role of IRBs through the common rule in situations where data is going to a HIPAA-regulated use. Uh, the HIPAA privacy rule uh, supplants the common rule for the HIPAA-regulated uses, including research uses now. Now, institutions are still free to insert their IRB. 
um, even if the law doesn't require them to. But I want to discuss why we need to rethink consent in AI applications. Is it doing a good thing? The old view that's often repeated in works about research ethics is that people's right of consent is so crucial that um, we're just going to disregard if consent causes selection bias, uh, that there's still a moral right to consent even if it compromises the quality of the science. And that view has been quite uh, common. We're in a different world when we're in using AI in clinical health care. If we have selection bias, it isn't an abstract problem. It's actually going to give bad health care to s some people. And, and that, that isn't something ethicists can ignore if, if we have biased data sets. So another thing is we've always framed that people who consent are doing an altruistic act. Their data will go and help other people in the future. That's not so true with uh, AI training data sets. The benefits of AI data sets are largely internalized to people who are well represented in the data set. And when you go in a set uh, and allow your data to be used, you're not necessarily helping other people. You're helping yourself. You're going to get better future health care because of it. We need an ethics that deals with the fact that the benefits are internalized. Do we need to be disclosing in the consent transaction that if you don't consent, you should be aware that your future health care may uh, not be quite as accurate? Uh, we need to rethink the specific case of AI and its data uses, and it may break some of the assumptions we've had for the past 40 years. I uh, just want to note that our current regulation, the common rule, um, and to some degree HIPAA when you use the safe harbor de-identification, was designed to deal with one type of privacy attack. There's a whole lot of other privacy attacks that are possible, and our regulations don't cope with them. Now, if you use the statistical de-identification under HIPAA, it can get it at a broader set of privacy attacks, but IRBs tend not to do that. They use consent and safe harbor de-identification as the go-to methods. There's empirical data to that effect. Um, I think one of our fundamental things is consent can be really important to show respect for people, but we treated it like it was a two for the price of one, that it would also simultaneously protect your privacy. Uh, consent may be ethical as a way to show respect for persons, but we need to get over this assumption that that alone will protect your privacy. It may not. We may need to do more. We have sort of framed the role of consent that I, we're going to make each individual responsible for their own privacy. And we have this sort of belief that if I opt out and don't let my data be used in your study, then your study cannot possibly hurt my privacy. The problem is our goal in doing studies is to do generalizable studies, right? So if I opt out and you proceed to do a study on other people that's generalizable, that study is going to support some inferences about me. Suppose your study is looking at 60-year-old women and it concludes that those with certain habits are at risk to have mental health issues that make them a Karen and they're very unpleasant. Even if I wasn't in your study, that's going to stigmatize me, right? So the privacy harms, it doesn't require my data to be in there. And then by the same token, if I opt out, my privacy isn't protected if we're doing generalizable work, which we hope we're doing. So research with other people's data affects my privacy even if I'm not in there. That's a, something we haven't coped with in our thinking about it. I think we need to consider learning these lessons. This is my next to last slide. With 
very large-scale data analytics, including AI, we are now in a world where privacy loss is systemic. Our privacy is very interdependent on what other people are doing. And if we as a society decide to use geolocation tracking smartphones to do big AI data sets, that affects all of our privacy, whether we opt in or opt out. Making studies more generalizable actually tends to increase the systemic privacy loss. If studies are generalizable, they support potentially privacy invasive inferences about more people. That doesn't mean we should stop trying to make our studies more generalizable. We want to do that, that's what we want. But what it means is we need to find ways to reduce bias in our studies within an enhanced ethic framework that may be quite different from what we've had before that will uh, put stronger duties on the data handlers. That's what's going to protect our privacy. I do a lot of thinking about what that should look like. I could talk on and on, but I'm not going to, about some specific things I could think of that we might do to try to improve privacy in this environment where we have now a systemic privacy loss that's, that's what we're fighting and where individuals can't necessarily protect their privacy by opting out or opting in. We need some broader controls to encourage that all people who handle data handle it responsibly. In an AI-enabled healthcare system, we have a lot of new players such as software developers that are in the healthcare transaction. Uh, they're not under state fiduciary duties like doctors and nurses are. Maybe we should put them under them to be careful with the data they handle. There are things like this that we need to think outside the box, but we are in a different ethical environment than we were 40 years ago when we invented the, the common rule, and it's different. I will now hand it over to our next speaker. How do I get my slides off? Do you know how this works? All right, guys. Thank you for sticking with us to the last session of the day. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, opportunities in healthcare delivery research. So we've delved pretty deep into IRBs and what that means in clinical trials, focusing in on the clinical aspects, um, some really nuanced discussion there, and I'll be talking more about what it means to do research at a broader level and the implications in AI. So just some background, this is honestly probably a review after two days, but um, AI and cancer care delivery, I think, has really exploded um, due to electronic health records. We have much more data, we have more granularity uh, to work with. We also have this digital health space where we have a lot of different new sources of passive and active collection of patient-generated health data. Uh, some strengths of current machine learning methods in this particular area in risk prediction, we see uh, tailoring to smaller subgroups and specific outcomes. Data integration and modeling complex patient trajectories over time is an emerging area. Classifying unstructured text, this is natural language processing, clinic notes, patient portals, communications between doctors and patients, Twitter, it, it doesn't matter. There's a lot more uh, use of unstructured data that can be used to evaluate quality of care and other health outcomes of patients. Um, and then finally, and this is what I'll be focusing on mostly for this discussion, is sophisticated real-time decision support tools. All right, so I'm first I'm gonna take a very quick look at a recent NCI portfolio analysis that we conducted. We wanted to look at trends over the past six years in applications we were getting focused on machine learning methods that incorporated EHR data. So this is using structured and unstructured data within the EHR um, applied into a machine learning methodology. Um, and the focus needed to be on cancer healthcare delivery research, uh, healthcare utilization, 
So this is like free admission, hospitalization, um, and then care quality, so quality of care metrics, uh, treatment adherence would be a good example of one. Um, and also patient health outcomes. You have survival, recurrence, regression, progression, um, but you also have quality of life, symptoms, function, quality of life of cancer patients. So for us, we wanted to look at uh, what, what we're funding, what we're not funding, and programmatic details. This helps us figure out where the field is going and how we can support you guys better. Uh, and then the second aim is to describe the type of projects we're seeing. All right, and there were three buckets in this larger review. Um, the first would be grants, and these overlap quite a bit. Uh, machine learning methods, so these are where people are taking, uh, adopting methods from other spaces and adapting them into care delivery research or with um, research data. So natural language processing, clinician notes, straight up great example of some of the creativity that's going on in that space. Research application, these are population and group level focus studies that we're seeing. They characterize populations at risk for poor outcomes. So these aren't necessarily being used in point of care or in the clinical care, but it's about characterizing and understanding people at risk of certain outcomes that can inform care. So we have things like cardiotoxicity, treatment adherence, patient monitoring, late effects. They all fall in here in predicting who's at risk. And then finally, clinical care application. And these is, this is research focused on use in clinical care settings specifically. The machine learning is applied to the integration of the clinical health data. Uh, it's at point of care. And an example of this is uh, clinical decision support for lung cancer screening. This can incorporate a lot of features of structured data from the EHR, imaging, a lot to in order to inform a clinician on whether or not someone is at high, medium, low risk and, and should be screened or rescreened. So uh, this is a pretty narrow application of, of clinical care and clinical decision support. I, I know we talk a lot broader in this this symposium, and I think a lot of it applies whether you're looking at an imaging tool to put into clinical care or some of these more complex. But I'm gonna give you a little flavor of what this research is looking like. And I think a, a key thing that you can see is that since 2016, I, there's been a, a big growth in the number of applications that have come in, particularly last year, and I don't expect it to go down anytime soon. This is just something people are doing more of. The type of outcomes that are coming in off these grants the, you can just see that uh, symptom, function, adverse events, these are important outcomes that are, are very much in the forefront of this type of um, AI work. Healthcare utilization, 30-day mortality, hospital readmission, treatment adherence, these are all things that fall under that category and are very important. Um, then we have patient-provider communication. A lot is being done with uh, portals, my chart being an epic portal, that's probably one of the more comparable ones that we see, but people are trying to figure out how do we use AI to understand how patients and providers are communicating with each other. Diagnosis, cancer diagnosis, and then, um, and these are the top five, there are a few more that fall underneath, but recurrence, progression, remission, um, like mortality falls under that a little lower, but these are things that are outcomes that people are studying. Um, but I really wanna focus in for the rest of my talk talk on the study focus. So you can see these are what the grants are um, setting out to do. And you see 40% have this algorithmic development only structure. And that's a pretty common one. You have developed the algorithm, validated, and that's kind of the core meat of the grant application. Uh, however, you can see that uh, the next most common one is that they are developing, they're validating, and then in the third aim, they are applying it into clinical care um, and solving problems. And, uh, and then uh, there's a much, much smaller subset that have validated a model elsewhere and are looking how it looks into a different setting. Now, this middle one is one that we see more commonly. People are very excited and interested about integrating these tools that they plan to develop and validate into clinical care right away. However, application is basically a whole area of science, uh, our science, and so um, it takes different expertise, different study design, and has different implications. And so shoving this all into a R01 five-year grant can be very challenging, if not impossible. Um, and I can't, I won't say these type of grants that are doing the whole kitchen sink aren't, aren't being successful or funded, but I think it's more of a challenge to make this case. So let's talk about some of the application issues in this area. Um, I'm gonna call this putting the cart before the horse. 
I'm not going into the specifics, but this is the EPIC sepsis model. Uh, this is something that, was wide, that had widespread adoption despite poor performance rates, it says. Um, it, it was implemented across uh, many hospital systems and an external validation found that not only did it not do a wonderful job identifying patients with sepsis, but it created a lot of false alarms. So this is a study in which you can see the implications. You put something in a system, it's not working the way maybe it had in validation, um, and, and the implications are pretty severe. Um, and the conclusions I threw up here, because I, I think it's, <laughs> it's interesting, I mean, it talks about uh, a growth in deployment of proprietary models led to the underbelly of confidential, non-peer-reviewed model performance uh, documents that may not accurately reflect real-world model performance. Owing to the ease of integration within the HR and loose federal requirements, hundreds of U.S. hospitals have begun using these algorithms. You know, I think this is a situation that's not great. If we think about it in a cancer, more cancer-focused example, um, a lot of projects are looking at predicting for clinicians if someone is within a 30-day or six-month mortality window, so that if someone's coming in, late stages of cancer, um, they get a flag that they maybe should be talking about hospice or other palliative care options. So imagine what happens when you start having false positives there. Uh, the implications both positive or pushing people into hospice that maybe are, you know, that are predicted as being um, within that six month window and aren't, and then the other way around. Uh, and it gets, uh, you can see that the ethical implications really start to mount. Uh, this is another application issue. It's kind of the other side of it. Um, so if you build it, will they come? I, you know, I think we're hearing a lot about some really great tools that people are developing. And this seems, I, I'm not talking at all about the tool. This was just an article that came out where they conditioned um, no use of an AI tool, an AI tool, and an AI tool with decision support. Uh, and what they found here, unexpectedly, the provision of information on the algorithm made no significant difference compared to AI without information. The reliance on AI correlated with general beliefs on AI's usefulness, but not uh, with particular assessments of the AI tool offered. So what this is saying, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking, well, if we explain it better, people will use it, this will work. But oftentimes there's other things going on in why people, clinicians, patients, and otherwise are using or not using tools. Um, and so it's thinking about how we look at what's going on at the point of care is very important. So this is where I get into implementation science. This, I think, is the only slide I have on implementation science, but this is something that I think is sorely needed, and it's probably something that you've heard. I'm going to go very high level here. Uh, this is the scientific study and use of strategies to adopt and integrate evidence-based health interventions, or in this case, you know, CDS AI tools, into clinical and community settings in order to improve patient outcomes and population health. It looks to, seeks to understand and support staff, health care organizations, healthcare consumers, and family members, and policymakers in the adoption, implementation, and sustainability of evidence-based interventions, these AI tools, and guidelines. And so I think what this means is that this is a different type of study, different type of study design, um, not one size fits all. So we have different ways we tailor when we look at implementation model, uh, implementation science, and the outcomes that you're assessing are different. It's not just if something works, it's about acceptability. Um, do people like it? Uptake, cost, fidelity, and then sustainment at the end. These are a different set of metrics. Um, these are different sub studies. So just in summary, validation is not enough. Uh, research is needed to focus on how AI tools can be success successfully applied at point of care, and one size doesn't fit all. You've got to look at how you need to adapt for different settings, different people, different end users, and then I think particularly for AI, the, the data quality, and this is a, a complex one. Study design and scope, pragmatic trials are needed, large scale, um, you really need to be doing bigger. Clinical informatics and infrastructure are key when we want to build out and think bigger. You need expertise in these areas. Uh, implementation science is its own field. Uh, people train in it and working on developing resources in order to effectively position yourself in these areas is important. Um, and then broadening the definition of success and these were the outcomes that I mentioned in the last slide. But fortunately for you, or I don't know, if any of this is calling to you, we at NCI do have funding opportunities in this area. These are not AI specific, but I, you know, these are about dissemination, implementation, research, and health. 
Uh, that's a pretty standing announcement. This is all interesting to you. There's one study <laughs> deadline coming up in October, but it's ongoing. But I think this bottom one here, this is an upcoming RFA that the, has been, there's a notice this is going to be released because the timelines are short. We're looking for pragmatic trials across the cancer control continuum. These pragmatic trials can have implementation science, can focus on AI tools. If this is something that would be interesting to you, this is the type of way you could test and, and learn more about what it means when you put these into care. So with that, thank you. Feel free to reach out. Um, yeah, appreciate it. Very good. Thank you for giving the applause. Let's give the applause to all the panelists. We are running a little bit behind schedule, so we will be uh, keeping the QA and uh, part of the panel session a little bit short. We're probably going to run until about 10 after 12, which gives us about 15 minutes for some questions. So if there are any questions that people would like to ask of our panelists, please go up to the microphone. Uh, if not, we've got some uh, of the uh, questions that we can derived from the cards that you filled out yesterday at lunch, uh, and we'll use those to get some initial uh, thoughts and reactions. But uh, anyone who has a question, feel free. Head up to the microphone. If not, I'm going to ask a question that came off across a card yesterday. Anybody want to? We got, all right, Amber, there you go. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. So Roxanne and I were sitting up here earlier, and we were scrolling Twitter. Twitter. We shouldn't admit to that, but... We both got the same thing come up, the same recommendation. And uh, so I turned to her and I was like, oh, look at this ethics of AI thing I just saw. And she's like, I just saw that too. And it's because we're in the same auditorium. We're in the same subnet, right? So Twitter knows that we're both here. And so we're getting the same recommendation. So that's like just terrifying to me in a way that I don't fully understand. But um, I think a lot about how we work with companies and the influence, and this is a particular Thing happening in Canada right now, probably in the US too, about how companies are accessing health data. I sit on, you know, a lot of RIB, REB type, R, sorry, IRB in the US uh, committees to help like guide what we allow access to. I also sit on a lot of committees for, you know, physicians that don't understand what companies are asking them for when they're asking for data. And I just wonder how we resolve sort of how we work with companies. You know, companies are not. Um, you know, there's good and bad out there. There's great ones that do wonderful things for our health systems. But, you know, I was also asked by an insurance company <coughs> to help them mine all their data so they could deny insurance to people, right? So it's a mix, mixed bag out there. And I wonder how we resolve that within this ethical framework that we're talking about going forward. Well, this is one of these aspects where we can no longer assume that the default is that the person receiving data is someone who has information fiduciary duties. And there are several ways we can create that framework. One is data use agreements um, that contractually would set some limits on things like redisclosure, uh, re-identification, and I'm not across the board against re-identification. It can be done for good purposes to, to be able to return an important actionable finding for someone, but there need to be boundaries on it. So uh, data use agreements, uh, the HIPAA privacy rule only requires it with a limited data set, but in theory, the, the covered entity that's sharing data um, should be able to require it on their own initiative. So I think that's one thing. Another is, uh, I think we should consider that the states who have traditionally been the ones that create these duties of confidentiality, they may want to look at the ecosystem of who all is going to be handling people's sensitive health data and perhaps create some new fiduciary categories that I, um, software developer that's handling people's health data without their consent needs to be on the same footing as a physician receiving that data would in terms of confidentiality and care for it. So I, I would start with data use agreements. I also, well, don't get me started. I can go on all day. <laughs> I'll stop there. I, I guess I would just add a couple of things to this, just my comment. 
Um, I mean, I, th <coughs> I think those are, this is a really important problem, and I think that, or issue. Um, and we have to remember, you know, what is the, you know, be, be clear about what is the intent of the use of that data, right? So if we're giving it to, we're selling it, if the, if the typically, you know, an institution may sell the EHR data to a company um, who's, you know, clearly is a for-profit motive, right? And that is a, you're taking, so, so again, it gets to the whole justice principle with the benefits and the burden, right? You can say, well, there's really no burden to the, to the patient, right? That data was already there, but I think that's too superficial, right? So I think when I said we need a lot more public engagement, I think people need to understand what's happening with their data. Uh, it, shouldn't be, it shouldn't be done behind the scenes. So if that data is being given to for-profit entities, you know, do you know that as, as the patient going to, is that your expectation when you went and got care at the hospital? Uh, and then are you gonna benefit from that in some way? How is that benefit gonna be given back to you? And the benefits and burdens of this kind of research are not fairly shared in our society by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and I think until we deal with those issues, this is always gonna be ethically problematic. Um, great points. Um, I think, so like thinking about this from a researcher perspective, uh, the example I gave with Epic and the sepsis model, it's not like Epic wanted to push out a model that didn't work. I mean, <laughs> so, but I think, you know, we still need an evidence base. There's a lot that we don't know, even with the best intentions, um, and we don't know what we don't know. So I, I think, you know, from research perspective, it's about kind of really targeting these knowledge gaps, going after it, and be thoughtful about these issues. I, this comes up all the time in getting, accessing data, sharing data. So, um, yeah. All right. Next question. Uh, qu question for, to Barbara Evans. So the, the way you talk to us today, I wouldn't be allowed to talk to my IRB. So I was very surprised <laughs> by your presentation. So this is a question from the software developer perspective. Uh, so I'm a data scientist and software development is a major part of our duty. So we're often pushed by the IRB to adopt dated IT infrastructure because it's infrastructure they are familiar with. So this idea of educating or having conversation with the IRB is something we generally try to avoid. And so my, my question to you is that what you told us today, is it being realized or absorbed or incorporated in practice anywhere or it's still in the conceptual stage? I'm a little hard of, I apologize, I'm a little hard of hearing and it could, yeah. could you summarize for me? Yeah, I, I think, Jonas, if this is what you were asking, the, the topics that you were talking about today, are those actually being deployed at any point and becoming part of practice, or are they still at a conceptual level of discussion? Yeah, and, uh, I'll give a very specific yeah. example. When we make data and code available, we put a lot of focus on the license and user agreement that okay. goes with our GitHub repository. And it sounds like this would address our fiduciary duties to protect the data and the interest and the, I guess, things that John Rawls would, would recommend. Uh, but I wonder if this would be acceptable or is in practice anywhere. The things I discussed today, the norms for data sharing in clinical health care, that is the current law and it is being used. Um, under the HIPAA privacy rule, you can use statistical de-identification instead of safe harbor. Safe harbor is very widely used still. Uh, uh, people, data gatekeepers feel comfortable with it, but there are some implementations where people are using uh, statistical methods of privacy protection uh, in lieu of and, and getting a st statistician to determine that adequate privacy protection is there. What I would like to see is greater use of the available ways to move data under HIPAA because it is um, reflecting the fact that in healthcare, in clinical healthcare, there is a cost that occurs when you don't share data. Uh, our 
ethics framework has looked very carefully at what is the danger if we share the data. But when people's health care is at stake, there's a real danger in cost in not sharing data if it leads to biased data sets. Um, so I, I do hope in the future we will make greater use of, of these capacities that are there. And it takes getting the public comfortable with some of the new methods of privacy protection and with technical safeguards and getting the gatekeepers comfortable with it too, whether it's an IRB or an institutional um, executive. Um, are we really comfortable that, that we can rely on, on the methods that are there? Zen Xiao from Lidos, um, the corporate parent company. Uh, I want to ask, uh, since uh, this topic uh, is related to data sharing, uh, how is the conversation with Office of Data Sharing Strategy um, at NIH, especially in the area of uh, secondary data use where the consent is not required? And how are you going to uh, incorporate that into the ethics discussion that we are talking about here. I'm not 100% sure I'm following. So I, I mean the, the question is, could, can you state that again? So the question is, uh, is there an uh, ongoing discussion with Office of Data uh, Sharing Strategy uh, in the context of um, the AI modeling and also the secondary use of the data, not just the original data sharing. I, you know, again, I, I come purely from the intramural program. And I, I am, there may very well be, but I'm not aware. I don't interact directly with ODSS, I don't know. Yeah, no, uh, um, the work I'm showcasing, I, 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 extramural, so people apply, and I, I grantees have to figure this out themselves. and have a network, uh, it's not shared internally at, unless there are stipulations on the award that's been given. So, um, but I think <laughs> it's a good question and you know, maybe we should uh, reach out to I some colleagues I think the Office there. of uh, at NIH, the Office of uh, Data Sharing Strategy, uh, they're implementing uh, next January uh, 2023, they have a mandate all the extramural grantees will require to share their data. Right, you're thinking the new data sharing management plan, that actually comes yes. out of the Office of Science policy, right? So that goes into effect for all NIH funded research, intramural and extramural, as you say, as of January. So it requires uh, much broader sharing of all data um, from NIH funded research. So that's, that's out there, that that's goes into effect. Um, and I think it's that any data that can be used to support, I can't remember the exact terms, it's not your lab notebook, but it's close, um, has to be by the um, end of uh, either the time of publication or the end of the project, your data has to be pub deposited or made available um, in, a, in, a, in a repository. I think that's, that's sort of the very short version and you should read the policy if you're subject to it. Yeah, and uh, with studies that have more of an EHR flavor, I think this gets very complicated, and I would say the devil's in the details, and we, we don't have the details yet, so. There, there's websites going up and all sorts of things about it. Right. So I'm just taking a look at the time, and uh, we're gonna take yeah. one more question, and I think we can go to lunch. So I, I just wanted to give a perspective as uh, a PI who's been funded through the NCI for the last 15 years. I want to say that a lot of PIs are very eager to share data. Uh, the issue or the challenge is really about doing it in a sustainable way. Um, I had um, a number of different projects where data was generated, but there wasn't a vehicle to be able to sustainably share data. I've worked with the TCIA, I've worked with the TCGA, we've contributed data sets, but the TCIA, TCGA itself is, is not well resourced, um, and so they have 
a bottleneck issue where they're at a point where they are getting more requests to host data than they can actually manage. So they've become very selective about what data they will actually accept and make available. Um, and it's very difficult from a um, grant perspective, a proposal perspective, to put in a proposal saying, you know, give me the money because I want to create, I want to host this data uh, on on a computer or on a server for the next ten years. Nobody's going to, I mean, it's, it, that, that, there isn't a mechanism today that exists within the NCI or NIH that will support that initiative. So, so I just want to just get some perspectives on, you know, on the, from, from investigators who are eager to share data. Now, how do we do this in a sustainable way? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, my area of research uh, is a little little different in terms of uh, the type of data structures and, and data sharing. Um, I don't have a, a great answer, except I agree, under-resourced. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know if others have other comments on yeah. this issue. I mean, there's, we could go on for a long time and just cognizant of people's time and even before we started this panel. Yes, Lynn, go ahead. I might just offer that the NIH Common Fund Bridge to AI effort is um, receiving and announcing new grants that incorporates ethics into every project and look for news about that coming out on a rolling basis. Yeah. All right. Uh, with that, I think we're going to be closing essentially the uh, portion of the symposium that has been in this part of the building. Uh, we'll be moving over to the Whitaker Campus Commons, which is where we had the uh, introductory keynote on Tuesday evening. We had lunch yesterday and so forth. Uh, and that's where we'll be actually having a concluding lunch for this symposium. I do want to thank you all for your time and, and devotion to this topic and the attention that you've been giving it, both as audience members as well as panelists and presenters and so forth. It's really fantastic to see. Even on the last day, we always you know, hear about the people that don't show up, but you, we are a really good crowd here, so give yourselves a hand. <laughs> and with that, I think we can transition into, into lunch, and then there will be some uh, final comments there as well. <laughs>